meeting pressing that button. Um, <laughs> really happy to sort of share what we've been working on the last couple of years in collaboration with Bianca, who's really um, spearheaded the efforts at UCLA to bring the biobank uh, here and sort of get get things moving with the, the with the R Foundation around ASXL related disorders. Um, so. I'm going to share with you our work. I, the title of our my talk today is Multi-Omic Studies in ASXL Syndromes. And sort of the overarching goal of my research lab is we, we're, we're interested in gene regulation of um, chromatin disorders. And so I'll go through sort of what all those things are and how a, a lot of these are related to some of the things that I study, I some other syndromes that I also study in the lab. Um, so when I think through genetics and health and disease, often what comes up is um, precision health and genomics. And so I think about genetics and genomics in sort of two distinct spaces. And often basic in the clinical world and in the research world, they come up in, they're studied in different ways and they come up different people tend to study Mendelian disorders versus complex disorders. But that, that distinction is sort of beginning to blur at this point. So for Mendelian disorders, I really think about them as rare. They're due to these single gene mutations. So a single gene with a mutation in one or both copies. These mutations are most often in genes that encode proteins. So if a gene encodes a transcript of RNA and that protein becomes sort of that functional uh, building block that actually is active in the cell and that that mutation in the protein has a really high effect, meaning that if you have that mutation, you will see some clinical phenotype in the individual, in the cell, in the tissue. And so you can um, really observe what the effect of this protein mutation are. To give that you some context, there's a lot of mutations that happen within um, our genomes that just sort of give rise to variability between individuals. And most of those have very little effect on the function of the protein. They're just, you can substitute one versus the other and it really doesn't make a difference. It doesn't change anything about how the protein acts within the cell. Um, and usually when we're thinking about Mendelian disorders, we find these, way, these um, disorders and the genes that cause the disorders by linkage analysis um, in large families. And more recently with the advent of next generation sequencing, we use exome sequencing. So some examples of Mendelian disorders that kind of contextualize this is all of the our ASXL related disorders, born Opitz, Shashi Penna, and Bainbridge Ropers, they're all considered to be Mendelian diseases in that there's one gene that's mutated and that mutation is necessary and sufficient to cause um, disease. When you take a look at complex disorders, um, these are heart, they're more common in the population. So these are things like diabetes, coronary heart disease. We know that the gene, your genes matter because we can see family history, but it's usually not just a single gene that's causing the disease. And I say usually because there are forms of diabetes that are, um, that are caused by single gene mutations. But for the vast majority of people, um, their complex disorders are caused by common genetic variants. You have multiple genetic regions affected. These are often, often these genetic variants that are identified, they're in these non-coding regions. So they don't actually encode for proteins, but they change how a, how a gene is regulated, how it's expressed, the levels of expression, things like that. And we study um, complex disorders using genome-wide association studies. And so these are studies that have usually hundreds and thousands of people. Um, you have some people with disease, some without disease, and you look to see for differences in their, um, the distribution of genetic variants. So when we think about complex disorders, these are things like diabetes and heart disease. Most of the time, these have been studied distinctly. So medical geneticists were typically studying Mendelian disorders. And then population geneticists and researchers would study complex disorders to look for these distributions, but they hadn't been used much in the medical literature. And so the question has become, as we have these new models and new ways of studying, like how do we study these types of disorders? And what we do know now is that for um, patients who have Mendelian disorders, they also have these common genetic variants and they may be predisposed to some complex disorders. So we know that there's this overlap that we haven't really fully appreciated in the absence of genome sequencing. Um, but when I think about how we study them, I'm really gonna to focus today on Mendelian disorders. There's a subset of my research lab that focuses on common and complex traits in, in biobanks, but that's not what we're gonna talk about today. Um, we're really gonna talk about Mendelian disorders and how we use patient-derived samples to get at mechanism. So just to provide like a larger context of what we're working on, um, within 
UCLA and a, a number of other institutions, there's a real push towards precision health and precision therapies. And what that means, most people think about this in the cancer context. So you think about like, if you see a gene mutation, you try to target either that mutation or some downstream effect of that mutation. And so what do you need in order to target a precision, to, to, tar to develop a precision therapy? I think to me, the most critical piece is to identify a mechanism. Because if you have a mechanism, so we have a me mechanism is a fairly broad term. You can think of that as what is a pathogenic genetic cause of a disease. So for something like boring opits, we know that they're caused by um, heterozygous mutations in ASXL1 but we don't actually know how that genetic mutation functions. So we don't know what effect it has on cells and development. And so that's also what I consider to be a part of mechanism. Now we have a gene that we can look at, but we're trying to identify what the mechanism is, what, how that gene affects cellular functions and tissue functions and ultimately human development. Once you have a mechanism, there's a lot of things you can do around screening for drugs that target that mechanism or downstream mechanisms. You can look for, you can test um, you can test certain drugs in model systems or you can develop model systems to test a large range of drugs and then ultimately you can move this into human trials but really the first step is the hardest step because that really requires a lot of um, a lot of testing that's in a very a very specific way so some examples of um, proteins that have been targeted. And I said earlier that most of the studies here have been around cancer. These are some nice examples of how people have looked at mechanism and identified uh, genetic mutations in order to develop drugs specifically targeted, targeting that mutation. So this is, these are some, um, some examples. So we know mutations in KRAS that, that are specifically this mutation you can actually develop these inhibitors to prevent that um, oncogenic pathway. And you can do the same thing for a lot of these other, so I'm sorry, but these are, <laughs> these are drug names for like EGFR. So EGFR is the overexpressed protein. But what the main point of this particular slide is to show you that like, if you know the gene involved and you know some of the downstream pathways, there is potential to develop um, single molecule drugs that can target either the gene mutation if it's a common mutation. So in some mutate, some um, cancers, you see the same exact mutation always happening. So you can target that mutation or to just uh, target that pathway that's downstream. So that's sort of ibrutinib. There's a specific type of mutation that we see in patients with myeloma and you can give that drug um, for to, to sort of inhibit that one pathway. Um, so the focus in my lab has been really around um, chromatin modifier genes because they all serve similar functions within a cell. Um, here you can see I have um, sort of a, a schematic where here you have the DNA. Um, can you see my, okay, uh, you have DNA, we have these marks on the DNA that represent sort of epigenetic changes. Um, and then these are different genes that we know cause neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, and all of these disorders are um, different chromatin modifiers. So they're caused by different chromatin modifiers. As you can see here, um, ASXL1, 2, and 3 are thought to be caused by abnormal methylation. But I think there's also a lot of evidence to show that they, they work not just in methylation, but in abnormal um, uh, histone ubiquitination. But what what the point here is, is that all of these chromatin modifiers, they work to organize your DNA. So if you think about one cell, within the cell there's DNA and that DNA is about two meters long. It's about six, roughly six feet. And you take that six feet and you, you, they cram it into something that's really a tiny nucleus, which is like six microns. It's smaller than the eye can see. And you cram all that, that string of DNA into this nucleus. So that's sort of the equivalent of taking something like 24 feet of string and stuffing it into a tennis ball. Um, it's not easy. And so it's really, these, um, the organization of your nucleus is really important. And these genes like ASXL1, 2, and 3 and other chromatin modifiers, they're really important in opening and closing um, your, or, or organizing your DNA. So your DNA here is wrapped around these things called histones, and then they're compacted, and we call it chromatin when it's compacted. And so the way I think about it is, is if you wanna make a brain, you need to open the book of DNA to certain pages that 
program neurons to show you how to make the different cells in the brain at the right time points. And so the chromatin is really, chromatin modifiers are really important to make sure that those certain pages are open at the right time so that you can read that transcript to make certain cell types or certain, certain parts of the body during human development. So here we have, um, what we know about chromatin modifier genes is there's a lot of them and they, they're active at different time points in development and in response to different things. So we know they're enriched in brain and heart congenital defects because we find mutations in these genes a lot in patients who have specific brain and heart issues. Um, the mechanisms for causing this disease, disease is still unknown because we it's very hard to study developmental time points. So we know that we, we see certain mutations, we have a sense of maybe what's happening, but we haven't really understood all the full downstream effects. And that's um, one, of the, one of our major goals in the research setting. And then we know that the burden of intellectual disability across um, the population is pretty large, but right now there are very few treatments. So the idea is to, if we can figure out how to harness um, chromatin modifiers that perhaps we can identify sort of a more global treatment across intellectual disability. So how do we do this sort of a, in a very concrete way? I've sort of talked very high level about chromatin and how cells and DNA are open and closed and organized. But the way we do this in the research lab is um, we often have patients, we obtain patient drive samples. Sample. So sometimes that's sometimes that patient. Uh, is there a question? So um, we have patient derived samples like fibroblasts. So we derive these from um, skin, these small skin punch biopsies. Um, and we grow them up in the lab. And then we ask questions and we measure things within the cell. We measure things about the DNA, how, how open or closed the DNA is and what is accessible in the DNA at certain time points. So one of the things that we do um, in collaboration with the Wexberg lab is we've done some DNA methylation arrays. Um, we, have, we have done in our lab the ATAC-seq and CHIP-seq to look at how open and closed certain regions of the genome are so that we know whether or not certain um, pathways are accessible and able to be um, activated in the cell. And then we look at RNA transcription because RNA transcription is a really nice readout of what is active in the cell and what processes are um, being activated. So when I say omics pipeline or multi-omics, you can just assume we're measuring something in the cell and we're doing it in parallel, so we're measuring everything we can for that thing in the cell. Um, and so omics can be the DNA methylation, DNA methylation that's, sort of, that's sort of omics assay. You can think about ATAC-seq, sort of the chromatin, and we're looking at all of the chromatin in the cells, the cells or RNA the in transcriptomics. Okay, so the other thing that I would like to highlight is that when we look at ASXL across the different, um, the different genes, we know that there's one, two, and three. They have different phenotypes, but they are pretty similar in structure. So you can see here, they all, all of the genes have this um, ASXN1 domain that is in common, and then also this ASXH domain. So, and so, so we know that there's some commonality across the three, and we think that perhaps there might be some common mechanisms. Um, that's something that we've been sort of exploring, but we've really started our assays here um, to really think about how what we can observe from what we have the most data for or the most samples for. So what we've done in the studies, the most recent studies and over the past uh, couple of years is we made a big effort to collect patient blood samples and patient derived skin biopsies. So many of you, um, if you were in Los Angeles back in 20, I think it was 2018 or 19 when we did one of the first symposiums, we had a clinic previous um, to that and we would draw blood if you draw blood and or do um, these skin punch biopsies, which is like the tip of a, you think of the tip of a pen, it's sort of about that size and we would do biopsies both on the parents and on the child um, so that we could get these cells that would kind of be able to grow and we can turn these cells into sort of um, more like stem cells for, for further study. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what we've done with some of those skin, skin fibroblasts. But essentially we take these samples, sorry, I'm pointing to my slides, but you can't see my slides that I'm looking at. And we take these samples, we um, assess them for RNA-seq, we do ATAC-seq, which tells you how open and closed your chromatin is, and then we do CHIP-seq. So we're looking to see what is methylated and what is not methylated in our samples. So this is the current cohort um, of ASXL1, and we used ASXL1 because we had the most samples 
um, within this group, we still are actively building the other ASXL2 and 3 cohorts, um, but we didn't quite have enough samples to, um, to do a fully powered study. So what you can see here on the top are, are variants that have been identified in the literature. And then the samples in the study that I'm gonna, studies that I'm showing you today are down here. So we have roughly 10, 10 patients, um, not every patient we have do we have both blood and fibroblasts we made it very optional so you could some of them we have both some we just have blood and some we just have fibroblasts um so one of the first things we were interested in was to look at fibroblasts and see how they cluster so what we would expect here is that if you had blood from a patient with boring opits versus a blood from a healthy control that you would see them separate out different uh, separate out based on the RNA expression. And so here you can see we have samples um, from the patients that from the patients with boring opits and they look quite different from our controls which are down here. Um, the controls are all parent controls so the parents who provided uh, blood samples at the same time. And what you can see here is that we have a number of differentially expressed genes so these are um, genes that are direct that are controlled by ASXL1 mutation. So if ASXL1 was mutated in the in the patient sample, which is up here, you can see that all of these genes have differences in how they were expressed. So what you could this is a we call it a normalized z-score. If you see a darker blue, that means that the expression is higher than the controls. And if you see a light blue, it means it's these lighter samples mean it's lower than in control control samples. So there's a lot of differences between um, the child and the parents. And you can see here also, this is a different way of looking at the same data. You can see that there's a number of genes that are have a much higher level of expression um, compared to the, the parents. And so this is the, all of these genes that I've labeled that are here in red are um, differentially expressed at a pretty high level. So these are all what I consider potential targets for um, for ASXL1. And these are all from fibroblast samples. The next thing we wanted to look at is, well, we see the transcription, but what happens to the actual ASXL1 transcript? So ASXL1 is expressed in both blood and fibroblast. And most people, because it is a truncating mutation, would say, well, you'll probably see about half of the um, expression levels of, of ASXL1 RNA. And the reasoning here is you have two copies of every gene. You'll have a normal copy, which is what we consider the wild type copy. And then you'll see the, the copy that has the mutation in it. And it's often thought that if you have a mutation, the types of mutations that we see in boring opits, that you actually wouldn't see any expression from that allele. It's something that we call nonsense mediated decay. And we think that the, pro, the RNA is actually degraded before we can even see it. But what you can see here is that this is our control with two normal copies of the ASXL1 gene. And it looks exactly the same or almost exactly the same as our ASXL1 patients. Um, so we don't actually notice a, a significant difference in expression, both in the fibroblast or the blood. We have some samples that are lower than others, but they're sort of one-offs. They're, the, they're not common. So we're not it's thought that this protein, this, this RNA for the mutant RNA from ASXL1 is um, expressed and probably also made into a, a mutant protein that is causing trouble in the cells. So the next question we really wanted to ask is, do, do these gene expression changes, the, this change in um, this mutant ASXL1 protein, do they cause changes in how open or closed um, the are the chromatin is. So chromatin can either be sort of closed and it's not usually not expressed and you would expect low RNA expression or it can be very open and you'd have much higher RNA expression. And that's sort of the what people typically think. It's not 100% true, but that trend usually holds within um, a lot of data sets that people have been looking at. So what we find is that our boring opitz patients have more open chromatin. So more, more of the genome is open, and that's not necessarily a good thing because if it's too open, sometimes you need things to be shut off because you need it to turn, you need that developmental profile to end so that the next one can begin. And so what, we, what we're finding, and you can see it here, is that these are our control patients. These are the boring opitz patients, and they just have a lot more dark blue. And that means that the chromatin, the, new, the chromatin is more open and you're seeing more of the DNA able to be expressed, which isn't always a, which, which 
yeah, it's very tightly regulated. So if it's not expressed at the right time point or in the right cell type, it can be a problem. And so these are some of the genes that are associated with those regions that are dysregulated in that boring opens. And then we finally, we took all those closest genes to these um, regions that are very open in the DNA. And we asked the question, are there any biologically relevant, um, biologically relevant um, pathways that we observe. Um, these are all known pathways that have been established in the literature. And so we put them through and you can see there are a number of um, processes that we think are probably important in human development, but also in, um, in, in response in neuronal and brain development, but a lot of other processes as well, including um, bone development and muscle tissue development. So these are all sort of telling us that we think we're we're seeing relevant genes that are being dysregulated, even though we're not always in the right tissue. So as like, I think what I'm trying to point out is that we're not looking at brain tissue, but we are seeing things related to um, neuron development. So axons are the, the long part of the neuron. So we're seeing these dysregulation of things that maybe shouldn't be there in the fibroblasts. Then finally, I just wanna make a quick, um, so I've told you we have, we're looking at open, chromatin, we're looking at blood and fibroblasts, but ultimately one of the, one of the key pieces in studying um, developmental disorders is to be able to look at, sorry, there's pediatrics is misspelled, but um, <laughs> to look at patient-derived iPSCs. And so these are induced pluripotent stem cells that we can make from fibroblasts. So one of the reasons that we're really excited about having patient fibroblasts is that we can actually reprogram these into iPS cells. And then we can compare um, neurons creating carrying mutations to healthy neurons. And we can do a lot of these experiments to look at early developmental processes without having to actually um, experiments that you couldn't do in humans and you would have to do in mice, but mice are not sort of the best, um, the best model for, for human brain development. The other thing that we think is really important is that we can then do these comparisons to look at how well the neurons fire that we make. We can look at um, immuno, we can look at the expression of ASXL1 and downstream proteins um, within these neurons or pre or early developmental neurons. And then the last piece is to think about rescuing the disease phenotype. So if we see a difference in how the neurons fire or how the um, proteins are expressed, we can then try out different drug screens to correct and use this as our measure. So as our measure of, of whether or not it got fixed or fixed the, at a given phenotype. So this is, these are some of, we're in the very early stages of this, right? We're kind of pre-step one. Um, for the ASXL project, we have taken two of the fibroblasts that we collected and created iPS cells, and we're just starting some of those early um, induced pluripotent stem cell studies. And so this is sort of real life, what it looks like in the lab. We make these iPS cells and they, um, they're, they kind of, they grow in these little colonies and we grow them into these neurospheres. So these are called um, brain organoids is how people think about it. They, we grow them into these neurospheres, which represent tiny little brain-like structures. And you can see these neural rosettes where the neuroprogenitors are starting to form here. And so we grow them in culture. This is out to 25 days, but people have grown them for up to like, I think uh, up to a year, or to, uh, even two years, you can grow these structures. Um, and you can get them to look similar to early brain development in, um, in utero. And so the goal is really in a dish to be able to say, well, this is, this is the pathway to normal neural development this is where the patient's samples are going wrong because they're going down this alternative pathway and to see if we can fix that pathway. Um, and the first step really is to find out what is going wrong because we know that the mutation is associated with something going wrong, but that in-between step is really critical for us to um, start thinking about even drug screens and, and more exciting things like that. So um, some of the conclusions in future directions, we see some cell type specific changes in ASXL1 mutations, but we don't actually see a change in the transcript. So we think that the transcript is being expressed, the, the mutant transcript is being dis expressed and uh, dysregulating things in the cell during development. Um, and we know that the mutations are associated with chromatin um, accessibility. So we know it's uh, associated with changes in how open or closed um, the DNA in the nucleus is, and that's associated with gene increased gene expression. Um, so trying to pinpoint which, which are the most critical um, 
changes are going to is going to be sort of our next step in the lab. So some of our acknowledgments of two people who really worked on this, um, two of my grad, one of my grad students and one of my MSTP students, Isabella Lin and Angela Wei, who's a bioinformatics graduate student. They're both still working actively on this project. Um, and this is some of our funding. And this is this is an old picture of my lab from about two or years ago, because all of our pictures right now are our Zoom photos. <laughs> so we haven't upgraded our, our, our photos. So I'm happy to take questions um, and see what comments and questions. I if you guys have questions about any of the um, terminology, I this is the first time I've given this talk um, to a family group. So I'd appreciate any comments if, if there's things that weren't clear, I'm happy to, to further explain them. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Arbolita. So we can move to questions now. So um, if anyone has a question, you are welcome. So you can raise your hand and uh, you can come on camera and ask directly. If you'd like to put it in the chat, I can help uh, facilitate that on your behalf. So one of the um, sort of basic questions that we got, to, this is sort of stepping outside of this presentation um, directly, Dr. Arbolita, but um, the difference between exome sequencing and uh, genome sequencing, and you mentioned that at the very beginning of your talk, if that's a, something you could explain uh, to some of the families, I think that would be appreciated. Yeah, sure. Um, so Clint, exome sequencing only sequences the part of the DNA that encodes RNA and proteins. And um, so typically it's it's um, it's more restricted and it only looks at the parts where we can actually do a diagnosis. Whole genomes, because we don't provide diagnoses for non-code regions of the genome that are non-coding that don't encode proteins, because we don't really know how to, it, they're very hard to study and it's hard to prove that a mutation in a non-coding region, they generally are, are less, um, I would call it like less potent. They're not going to cause uh, something like boring opits. So we don't, we, as far as I know, we don't have any non-coding variants that encode for things like um, ASXL1, 2, and 3 mutations. Um, so when we say exome sequencing, I think about exome sequencing um, as sort of the classic diagnosis, like that's what you need for most of the diagnoses around boring opits and shashipenna um, and Bainbridge ropers. Now, if you were to go to whole genome sequencing, that sort of sequences the entire 3.3 billion base pairs of the genome. It has one added benefit, and the added benefit is that you can actually start to look at structural variation. So you can look for parts of the genome that are deleted. You can look for parts of the genome that are inverted or translocated. So if like chromosome two and chromosome five somehow matched up together and were, were somehow connected, you would be able to detect that by whole genome sequencing. Um, Generally, from a very clinical standpoint, there is not much of a difference between exome and genome because you're looking at the same set of genes, um, and we only really look at the coding region of the genes. Um, most people look at whole genome as more of a research tool. So it's, I mean, and Bianca can maybe speak to the, the clinical utility of it, but when we do whole genome sequencing, we're typically doing it more on the research setting than on the clinical setting. Yeah, I think there's there's always a possibility that we're missing some diagnoses of people who maybe have um, genetic changes in those introns, those in-between spaces that we don't sequence in a genome. But for anyone who's currently sort of in the ASXL community, most people have been diagnosed on exome and there's no reason to go and do a genome on those people. There may be some folks out there who we haven't identified yet who have changes in those in-between spaces that you pick up on genome. Thank you. It's a pretty quiet group. I don't see any other questions. There must be some. Well, I can ask my own question. Um, when we were sort of getting ready to set up this talk, we were, we were speaking a little bit, Dr. Arbolita, about some potential partnerships with other organizations that have, you know, potential sort of similarities in, in genetic conditions and that sort of thing. Could you speak just a little bit about how 
what are some of the other um, syndromes that may be similar to the ASXLs that we could potentially sort of think about how to maximize the work that you're doing by potentially looking to other groups to work with them or, or maybe learn from what they're doing or even how you're doing some of that in your own work already? So I'm gonna I switch to this slide um, where I talked a little bit about sort of more broadly about chromatin modifier genes. Um, and so these are genes that all function or are thought to function primarily in the same space and trying to open and close chromatin. And there's a lot of different mechanisms to open and close chromatin. You can use uh, histone methylation, ubiquitination, acetylation. So adding different like lollipops onto the, the histones can make them open or close in different ways. Um, and so there's a lot of commonalities in, in some of these mutations as far as what organ systems are affected. It's often the brain and the heart. Um, whether or not they're actually working on some common downstream pathway is still a little bit unclear. Like we know that these same mutations in these, uh, in these genes probably act in concert and some of them act, a lot of these um, proteins, they act in these larger complexes. So um, I work a lot in CAT6 A and B and it, those two genes are sort of similar to the way we think about ASXL1, 2, and 3. They're, they're very similar in their structure and they actually are part of the same complex but their distribution in the cell is slightly different um, in, in, across different cell types. The phenotypes are quite different from each other in the same way that 1, 2, and ASXL phenotypes are different, but we think that there's some common pathways, and I think that the, it remains to be explored how, um, how common, and if there, if there's some like convergence pathway at, to, that you can target that would help benefit multiple groups. And I think it's, I don't know which one is the best because it's hard to tell from a clinical standpoint, there's so many other factors that um, interact with how some, what the clinical expression of disease is, um, that it's hard to kind of tell what is disease, sort of the mutation specific versus all the other variants in the background that's sort of present in all, all, all individuals. So we know that, the, I think I alluded to this a little bit, but we know that there's like the, um, the mutation that causes disease. And then there's all sort of this common genetic background that we have that we share with our family. And that often can have some subtle effects and influence how one expresses disease, the disease state. And so I think that there's, it's really hard to say without doing these careful, well-controlled studies. I know that um, Dr. Wexberg has studied a lot of different chromatin disorders across DNA methylation, and she might have some insight as to how, like the, whether how common certain aspects of methylation signatures are. Thank you. All right, I have a question in the chat here. Um, this one is, uh, in the best case scenario, how would your research benefit people with boring opiate syndrome? In the best case scenario, it, <laughs> it, I think in the best case scenario, we would be able to find some drug target for something either just downstream of ASXL1, 2, or 3 um, that would help in some of the clinical features. So it might alleviate um, some awareness issues or help with some, I don't wanna say curative because a lot of these processes are developmental, but I do think that chromatin, like you can sort of um, optimize what's there so that you can improve some of the cognitive function. And so that's one of the things that we've been really kind of looking at across patients with chromatin modifiers is we know they're all associated with some form of intellectual disability. And so whether or not you can find some target that might, um, even if the, the sort of the general structure of the brain is not quite normal, that you may still be able to optimize that and get it to work as best it can by even, even during um, early childhood and adolescence, because we know that the brain is still developing at that time point. Um, and I think there's a lot of, a lot of plasticity within the brain and within human development. Like I just showed you that we can take skin fibroblasts, like cells that are meant to be part of your skin, and we can turn them into stem cells that can make, that can go into brain organoids. So there's still a lot of plasticity that um, isn't fully understood. And I am a little bit of an optimist when I say like, I just sort of seeing what I've seen, I think that we can probably make things better for, for a lot of the kids um, so that they can live as full of lives as they're, they're capable of. Thank you. 
All right, so we have um, someone with their hand up. That's Linda Hilton. Linda, you're welcome to come on screen and ask your question. Um, well, okay, I can come on. Screen. Or just voice. <laughs> I know, there I am. Um, so this may be for Bianca. Um, as I'm, I was, I'm working on the glossary of terminology and trying to piece it together in my mind. Um, I had, I had asked the question about the exome and the genome, but also was curious about the, the phenome piece of this. And I think where I read in one study, Bianca, it's possible that um, the mother is a carrier. And in my case, when I, I showed up asymptomatic to any genetic mutation, that doesn't necessarily mean that I still couldn't be a carrier of it. Is that correct? And how does the, what is the phenome? I guess I, I, guess I need to know that to understand my question better. Um, do you want to take any of that, Val, or do you want me to? <laughs> you can go for it. <laughs> okay. So I think what you mean by phenome, and hi, Linda, it's good to see you. It's been a while. Um, but I think what you mean by phenome is sort of what's the clinical presentation. So we often talk about what's the phenotype and what's the genotype. So the phenotype is what you physically see. So what someone's symptoms or features are, and the genotype is what is the genetic change or the alteration that you see in the genetic code. Um, and so when we talk about how someone phenotypically looks compared to their genetics. That's one of the, the kind of buzz terms we talk about. Um, when it comes to it, whether it's inherited or, when it, or it's new, most of the time it's new. So it's a random change in the genetic code that just happens at conception. But as geneticists, my running joke is always, we never use two numbers, zero or a hundred because there's never anything that's that certain in our universe, right? So um, there's always a chance that um, a mom or a dad can have some of their egg or sperm cells that have a genetic change that they can pass on to their children. And so that's why we always give this sort of residual risk of a 1% chance that there could be another child in the same family. Um, there's no way for us to go and test everybody's eggs and sperm cells. So there's no way for us to know that cer for certain. The best we can do is test parents' blood um, or saliva and say that it's not found in their blood or saliva, but we can't go back and test all the um, eggs or sperm cells. So that's why we still say there's always a chance you could carry it in a small number of your cells, but if we didn't find it on your genetic testing, it's not in all the cells of your body. Okay, that definition helped tremendously, and thank you. Thank you. So the next question is about um, how to provide samples to the biobank. So um, both Dr. Arbolita and Dr. Russell are really uh, highly involved in running the biobank at UCLA, and you know a lot of Dr. Arbolita's work here is made possible by some of the samples that have been collected through the biobank. So the specific question is, if, if someone is not in LA, what is the best way to provide a sample to the biobank to help with your research? Um, I can I can take that one, but I will give a shout out to um, to Dr. Arboleta because I couldn't do anything that I do without her. So she does all the work on the back end. All I do is help with the coordination side of things, but it's her lab that does all of the work on the back end. So um, the easiest way to do it is actually to email us at the registry email, and that triggers a process for us to work with you on getting sample collection. We were at a bit of a hiatus for a while, but we're back in operational as of last week. So we're really excited to be recruiting new samples. Um, and we will work with you to find the best routes to get samples collected for you locally. Um, whether that's going through your local doctor or your local hospital, um, and then getting those samples shipped to us and we'll send you the FedEx shipping and everything. You just put it in the envelope. So um, we will help you organize that. Go ahead and send us an email. It's probably the best way to get that started. Um, but Dr. Arboleta does all the work on the back end. So I personally <laughs> think that, that the hardest part is the organization. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think we make a good pair as far as like <laughs> optimizing on our skill set. <laughs> And here's the typical follow-up question, Bianca, what about international folks who are outside of the United States in terms of samples? 
international has been really tricky for us. I think we've got one sample that after many, many months, we think we're getting moved, um, but it is quite tricky for us. So we kind of go case by case and see what we can navigate. Canada is easier for us and we can potentially even get things to Dr. Wexberg's lab. Sometimes that route is easier if we know we want a sample for some of her work. So um, Canada may work a little bit better for us than some of the other countries, but we will certainly do our best and we will try. Thank you. And um, Bianca, this may actually be a question better suited to you. Um, is there a, a known reason for why being nonverbal is a typical factor in boring open syndrome? That's a really good question. We don't have an answer for that. That just tends to be the pattern that we see. Um, we'd love to understand that more. And I think some of Dr. Arboleta's work would eventually hopefully get to something like that um, to understand more on the cellular level where the disconnect is and why language is hard to develop, um, but we don't know yet. Thank you. All right, um, let's see here. Uh, another question about samples. Uh, is there value in providing samples again if someone has already provided one to the biobank? Um, the answer is it depends. So we have <laughs> asked some families to give um, additional samples when we've done some preliminary work and noted that we needed to look in more detail or we needed a different sample type. Um, it's always reasonable to touch base with us and ask and say, hey, we're willing to donate again, or we're having an upcoming blood draw. Do you want any additional sample or something along those lines? But um, we also have reached out to some families where we've specifically wanted samples from them. Um, and so there may be opportunities again in the future. Um, it's, it's a little bit dependent on the situation. Yeah, and sometimes as we analyze this, the, the first pass of data and, and new experiments come up, sometimes the experiments require fresh samples. Um, and so it's always good, it, it, it's always helpful to touch base with, with the team and sort of see if, if there's anything along those lines. Because occasionally I'm thinking about it, I'm like, oh, we don't have samples, we can't do that experiment. And then um, Dr. Russell will email me and say, hey, there's a family who's interested in providing more blood samples. Do you think they're useful? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so so that's, always, um, that's always kind of in the back of my head as we're um, put going through experiments and thinking about what the next steps are and what would be helpful. Sometimes we can do it on the existing fibroblast um, ASXL1, and two are both highly expressed in blood, which is a, a real benefit for us because um, it, then it's, it's a good place to study. Some of the genes are not expressed in blood at all. And so we could study them in blood, but we won't get very useful information because they're just, um, they're, they're, not, they're not there and therefore they can't affect the, any of the profiles and the omics profiles we're looking at. Thank you. Okay, well, that brings us to the formal conclusion of um, this part of the program. So I'm gonna stop our recording now. And